Well, welcome to uh, services on Palm Sunday weekend. Uh, what that means for us in the Christian community is that this is the celebration on the church calendar of the week that Jesus spent in Jerusalem. He went back into Jerusalem the last week of his earthly life, and so we celebrate all these elements. And, and even though we're going to preach on something a, a little bit different, I, I want to read the, the Palm Sunday or the, the Palm uh, Triumphal Entry story with the palm branches and, and Jesus riding into town. I want to read this because this is a part of our heritage, and part of what it is to remember the Easter story is to remember the whole story and, and how things took place. So let this just wash over you. It's from Matthew chapter 21, starting at the beginning. Here's what it says. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and you will send them at once. Don't try this at Walmart. Amen? Right? We've already talked about that. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and others cut branches of trees, palm trees, that's what we call it, Palm Sunday, and, and spread them on the road. And the crowds went before him, and they followed and shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It was an amazing moment because in Jesus' ministry, he'd met many obstacles and he'd been put, put down, but, but there were people who'd been waiting for a Messiah. They'd been studying the scriptures. They'd been hoping. Everybody say hoping. They'd been hoping for a Savior, somebody to come and rescue them. And, and they'd seen this teacher. They'd, they'd heard what he had to say. They'd watched the miracles. And now, as he comes riding in on a donkey, it's like all the pieces fall into place. Wait, there was a prophecy. Someone who could save us, someone who could teach us, someone who could heal us. And they start putting the pieces together miraculously. This crowd, Jesus didn't have any spin doctors around him. He wasn't on the, the O'Reilly spin zone factor or whatever that was. I mean, just all of a sudden, people start putting the pieces together and they run out and they say, this is God to be him. They throw their cloaks on the ground. They're waving palm branches, and they're singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's Jesus' final entry into the city before he becomes a sacrifice for us. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And as we celebrate this Easter week coming up, we remember every element of it. And you have been just like these who show up on the side of the road. They'd been studying the Old Testament. They'd been looking for a Savior. And just like we've been going through this series called Shadows, on the count of three, everybody say shadows. One, two, three. Shadows. As they'd been looking for shadows, they were looking for hints. Who's the Messiah going to be? When is the guy coming who's going to save us? They, when they recognized him, they ran out and they praised God for seeing him. Well, we've been spending the last eight weeks searching the Old Testament. We've seen pictures, shadows, images of Jesus in not the New Testament, but the Old Testament. In the story of the creation, in the story of the Garden of Eden as he was promised. In the prophet Jonah, in the belly of the whale three days, so was Jesus in the belly of the earth. In the story of Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice of the father who was willing to give his son just over and over again. And now, when we get a chance to see Jesus, it should cause us to raise our hands up and go, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, that's the whole purpose. I've been so proud of us to tackle what we've tackled for the last few weeks. We've gone deep and we've, we've tried to study some difficult things. And we've learned to approach the Bible from what we have called this Christocentric view, finding Christ everywhere from Genesis to Revelation. It's been such a joy in this journey. And this weekend, well, we're going to finish up our shadow series before our Easter finale. And as we do, the shadow that we're going to look at is not one that was originally on the list. You may have thought, wow, it's amazing. I wonder, wonder if we can fill up eight weeks of these shadows. Guys, we have about a dozen more that were on the list that didn't make the cut. I mean, great stories and great images. And, and we had one that hadn't quite made the cut. But because of what's happening in the world today, we bumped what we were going to do when we put this one on the list. Today we're going to look at Noah because Noah's in the news. Now, I'm not here. My job is not to be a critic of the Hollywood film industry. Can I get an amen if I try that one more time? My job is not to be a critic of the Hollywood film industry. 
My job is to lift up God's word and to point people towards Jesus. That's what my job is. And so I'm not here to battle what's going on in the film industry. And I know there are people, oh, the drama on Facebook over this movie. Great googly moogly. Everybody's, everybody's got an opinion. Well, you know, at least they're causing people to think about the issues and go to study their Bible. It's an abysmal thing. It's the sign of the end. I can't believe they would do this. Listen, I haven't even seen the movie, okay? So I'm not going to talk about the movie. I don't have a, a basis to talk about the movie. But I do know this. I've read this story, and it's better than the movie. Amen. And so we want to talk about who Jesus is in the person of Noah. You say, well, what are you just talk about Noah. No, no. We can see Jesus. We're looking for Jesus in the Old Testament. We can see a picture of Jesus even in the story of Noah. It's absolutely amazing. You say, well, what about the movie? Listen. I don't know much. I've only read the blogs that you've read and heard the news stories. Pretty sure there weren't giant rock monsters that helped Noah build the ark. I'm pretty sure that God didn't destroy the world because he was upset with all the plastic bottles that Noah's generation had thrown in the ocean. I'm pretty sure that the issue was that God was dealing with sin and salvation at a very serious level. And that's why this story isn't about culture. This story is about how much the God of the universe loves humanity and refuses to let us waste our world and waste our lives in the way that we would if he wouldn't intervene. Amen. And that's, that's where we're going to see Jesus. And all God's people said? Amen. With that being the case, I want to pray for us. And I want to ask that God would direct our hearts to hear not what Andy has to say, but what his word has to say. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. And I pray that you would use this broken preacher. I admit my sinfulness, my flaws, not only to you, but to all those who are listening. Please let each of us know that if anything is communicated, it can only be by your spirit. It can only be by your authority and your power. We can't even hear without you. We need you to unclog our ears, to, to calm our hearts and our minds so that we can hear what your spirit has to say. And we pray that we would somehow be different because we have had the opportunity to study the story that is captivating the world right now but that has been a part of your book from the beginning. Help us to be forever different because we see your son in the promises kept in Noah. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now take your Bibles or look on the screen or uh, get in your notes. We've got multiple places for you to follow through in the story. We're not going to read the whole Noah account because that would take far too long. So I've broken it down into three different sections. Two passages from Genesis chapter 6 and one from Genesis chapter 7. And it should give us kind of a broad outline of what's going on in the, uh, in the Noah story here. So we're in Genesis chapter 6 starting in verse 9. And let's just read a little bit about Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Everybody say righteous. righteous. Blameless in his generation. Everybody say blameless. blameless. And Noah walked with God. Everybody say walked. walked. Man, if you could have those three things on your tombstone because they were true about you, would that not be a good life well lived? Andy was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and he walked with God. Probably all it's going to say is Andy died of bacon. That's probably all it's going to say. I wish it would say something like this, but I'm pretty sure it's not. Anyway, the, this is a, a great story about a guy that we've got a great snapshot of in just that one verse. Verse 10. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. All flesh, all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Verse 13, same chapter. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. What's gopher wood? It doesn't mean go over there and go for some wood. It actually means a kind of wood, probably cypress, which was very abundant in the area, very, diff very hard, very difficult to work with. In uh, verse 17 of the same chapter, For behold, I will bring a, flood, bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Now jump to chapter 7, look at verse 15. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life, and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And finally in verse 17, the flood continued 40 days on the earth, 
The waters increased and bore up the ark. I'm going to say that phrase again. Bore up the ark. Say it with me. Bore up the ark. That's going to be important. And it rose high above the earth. Now, what we've done, this is kind of an encapsulation of the Noah story. And by, by the way, why do we make this a children's story? This is a devastatingly cruel, dark story, isn't it? But we always we like paint it on children's walls and in the nurseries at churches. And like, oh, isn't it a beautiful story about the animals? Yes, it's the day God killed everybody. That's just a, it, it's a, it's a difficult story. And I, I don't know why we make some of these children's stories. It's legit. It's real. And we're going to talk about it. But this is, we're going to talk about the real version of this and why we can see Jesus in this story. You'll see in your notes, I've broken it into four concepts. As we look at this, we want to look at Noah from four different angles and see the shadow of Christ in this passage. First of all, let's talk about Noah's character. As we do in verse 9, it says, These are the generations of Noah. He was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. It's pretty easy for us to do this, isn't it? It says that Noah was a righteous man. And if we look at the person of Jesus Christ, We're going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can find a reflection of somebody who was so righteous and so blameless. Now, obviously, Noah wasn't completely righteous and blameless, for there is none who is that righteous and blameless. In fact, matter of fact, it says in Scripture that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Only Jesus is totally righteous. And we know that Noah had some mistakes because right after the whole ark episode, he got so wasted that his kids shamed him and this and that. I mean, it was, Noah is very much a human being. But compared to everybody else on the earth at this time, he was righteous and blameless and he walked with God. Everybody say, walked with God. When my kids were a little bit younger, this was fun to watch. It's not so much fun now because they can do it pretty easy. But we'd be walking from the car into the store. And, and I'm a big guy, you know what I mean? I'm six foot four. And, and when I walk, I, I just kind of walk. And, and I, I've always been frustrated people didn't keep up. And it was only when I married a shorter woman and had shorter children that I realized it's because I'm taller. That's why I'm faster than everybody. I, I have this kind of gait. And, and I would look, and as we're walking from Walmart or walking from the car into Walmart, I would watch my kids, and they're doing lunges like this and, and acting goofy. And I'm like, what are you doing? And when they were little, they were going, they're keeping step with me. And it was funny to watch that. And now it's easier for them. As they've grown, they can keep step. Everybody say, keep step. step. And keep step easier. Here's what the passage did. It described Noah in this way. He walked with God. In other words, his life in this weird world where all this brokenness was, he was keeping in step with God. And so at first we can see maybe a hint that this would connect him to Jesus, but I think there's something even better that connects him to Jesus. We don't see this because we don't speak Hebrew, but let me help you out with this. The name Noah actually means rest. The name of Noah means rest rest. In a chaotic world with all the struggle, with all the pain, with all the suffering, with all the hurt, with all the violence, with all the corruption, his name meant rest. Now, wait, wait, wait. You've got to go back and you've got to understand Jesus. Jesus would come and he would teach in Matthew chapter 11. He, he taught this incredible lesson. He said, come to me, you who are weary. Come to me, you who are burdened. What did he say? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, those religious specialists, they've taken rules and regulations and they've bundled them up and they, they've stuck them on your back. And, and what they've done is they put heavy burdens on you. And he says, but, but take that yoke. You know what a yoke was? A yoke was that wooden bar they put between two oxen that pulled a cart. That was called a yoke. He says, take off their yoke and put on my yoke, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, you who are weary, and you shall find Oh, do you see this? In in an era of, of brokenness with the weights of humanity on all of them, God said, I will rise up one and he will be a man of rest. And Jesus comes and says, come to me, for I am a man of rest. Oh, I remember being about 10 years old and being the tiredest I've ever been. Can you remember back when you were the most just broken, tired you've ever been? Everybody's got that moment. You're just like, I can't even tell you. I'd never been more tired. I was that tired because I was on vacation in California with my family, and that's where all my family's from. And and while we were out there, we had like a pudgy 10-year-old who never got off the couch, right? That was me. I I read books. That's what I did. And and so I'm this kid on the couch, and and my family says, hey, your your cousins are going to go hiking in the mountains, and and we're going to send you with them, which was dangerous because they were 20-something college guys. You know what? They're all in graduate programs. They're super hip, and they're cool. And they kind of looked at me like, yeah, we'll take the boy. That'll be all right. And you can almost hear him conspiring at the back end of the truck. Let's kill him. Let's let's make this miserable. And we got out there, and I remember I packed a bag because I thought, 
well, what am I going to need? I took Twinkies and Ho-Hos, and, and I had a pocket knife and a book and a flashlight. And it wasn't, we were supposed to be back before dark, but I mean, I, I got everything in this bag. And I'm like, I'm ready to do this. We can survive a weekend. And we start going out there, and these guys had no mercy on me at all. I mean, they were like running up. The, the elevation's killing me. And they're these, these young men who are strong, and this is what they do every weekend. I'm this, this is this little couch potato trying to run after them. And, and then they would holler back comforting things like this, hurry up or we'll leave you. That's not cool, you know? And we're going up the hill, and, and, and one of them would kind of lag behind a little bit and go, come on, come on. And then when I got wind that whenever all of them stopped to wait on me, they weren't stopping to wait on me. It means they found a snake they were going to throw on me, something like that. It was miserable, and, and we, we'd been going for hours. I mean, literally, we'd been going for like four or five hours. We finally sat down on a rock, and, and the river's going by, and they're talking about how beautiful it was, and I'm going, <clears throat> and I finally got enough breath that I asked one of them, I said, so how close are we to being done? And he looked at me, and everybody kind of chuckled. They go, well, we're about at the halfway point. We'll turn around in another hour. And my little 10-year-old chubby legs about fell off my body right there. And they, you could hear them all kind of chuckle just a little bit. But one of those guys, one of those 20-something guys, he looked at my face, and he could tell, I think we're going to kill Andy. And so when we got up to go, he kind of sat down next to me. He said, trade me bags. I said, what? And he goes, just trade me bags. And I took my bag off and I gave it to him with the Twinkies and the Ho-Hos and the flashlight and the, the rescue horse, everything I had in there. And he gave me his backpack, which felt like there was nothing in it. I stood up, I felt like a new man. And he never said a word to those other guys, but he put my bag on and he took off. And oh man, it felt so good. He gave me rest. He took that heavy bag off of me. Noah's name means? And Jesus said, come to me. I want to take those burdens off you. I want to take those sins off you. I want to take those troubles off you. Cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. Put it on him. Jesus will carry the load. Take his yoke for it is easy and light and he will give you? Mm. And you see just the beginning of a snapshot, even in the name of Noah. Verse 12 says this, And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. In verse 13 it says, And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. This is difficult because there are some hard things being said here. And the first is this, Noah came into the world when the world was corrupt. Noah came into the world when the world was corrupt. It was broke. It was bad. He is righteous and he is blameless and he walks with God, but everybody else, everybody say everybody. Yeah. Everybody else, everything else is messed up. He comes at this broken place. Not only that, there's a promise that's being made here. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. Noah also came when God's judgment was certain. So a righteous man comes into the earth when God's hand of judgment is about to fall. That's some bad timing. You ever shown up at the wrong time, the wrong place? I mean, you've got a righteous man who shows up when God's about ready to wipe out everything. But it was actually on purpose. It was actually because God wanted to use this man, Noah. God, God wanted to use this man, Noah, in the middle of that judgment. Let me, let me back this up. God never is late, but he is seldom early, too. Does that make sense? God's always on time. Everybody say, always on time. And when Noah showed up in this corrupt generation, it's just like they said about Jesus in Galatians chapter 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to free us all. That it's a matter of timing. And that when we look at this and we see, but this is difficult, Andy. I, I don't even want to believe that this is a God I could serve, that God had determined to make an end of it. God determined he's going to wipe everything else out. This is hard because we get in our minds, he can't really be a good God if he's just made up his mind he's going to wipe everybody out. But you have to understand, first of all, he is holy and we are not. If God never did another thing for us, if God didn't heal us, if God didn't provide for us, if God didn't answer another prayer, the fact that God has sent his son and we have the opportunity to be forgiven, if that's the only thing he ever did, he's already done more than we deserve already done more. Secondly, you need to understand what this passage actually says. It says, for I have determined. It's actually a very difficult Hebrew phrase. Let me give you the phrase 
It's a colloquialism that we have to translate into English. Here's what it actually says uh, in rough form. It says, the corruption of humanity is in my face. In other words, a holy God is looking at the world and it says, if I could translate this for you in very pop culture terms, it's all in his face. Anybody here raised a teenager? You know what I'm talking about? God loved my, I love the teenagers. I love them to pieces. But every now and then they puff that chest up. They get the attitude. They stick their nose up. And they just get in your face. No teenager is looking at me with love right now. I can just see that. I can tell right now. I'm feeling, I'm, feel, I'm getting that look. That one right there. I'm getting it right now. They get all puffed up. They get in your face. And when, have you ever, I mean, you're a loving parent. You love your children. Please say you love your children. Amen. You love your children. But when your children get puffed up and in your face, don't you just want to sock them one? I mean, don't you just want to like, hey, come here, come here. Mm, take that in Jesus' name. I mean, you don't do that because you're a parent and you love them, but, but it, sure, it sure would be nice every now and then. Wouldn't that be nice? You have to understand that generation after generation, person, and not just puffed up and being arrogant, but violent, killers, rapers, difficult people for generation after generation have puffed up and have been in the face of God. And God in his righteousness and holiness has finally said, that's it. Your mom ever said this to you? I've had it up to here. Say, I thought God was a God of mercy and love. He is. It pours out. If God wasn't a God of mercy and love, he'd have wiped us out again and again and again, probably every generation. But there came a place where it was so corrupt and so broken, God says, it's so in my face. I've made the determination. It's time to control, alt, delete creation. We have to reboot the system. And he was, Noah came in an age in which that was not a probability. It was a certainty. How do you know when things are certain? I've been preaching here for 12 years. I've been in pastoral ministry for just over 20, I think it's 22 years. And uh, in the last 12 years, I won't go further back than that, but in the last 12 years, as I preached almost every week, I don't think there's been a single week go by. I don't think there's been a one go by where somebody hasn't said, good sermon, pastor. The problem is, I've heard me preach all those sermons. And I can tell you as a fact, they weren't all good. I know they weren't. Now, I know you're being encouraging and loving and supportive, and God bless you for that. That's great. But there are, certain, there are some times I get done, and I want to quit my own church because the sermon was so bad. Does that make sense? I should go someplace else. I'm not getting anything out of this pastor. I mean, I understand that. It's difficult. And so it's hard. It begs the question, how do you know when somebody's being real? I mean, how do you know when somebody's really saying, that was good, that moved me, that, that touched me? Well, my wife, you know, she's been with me a long time. She's heard me preach more than any of you. And my wife, she has a Bible that she's had for years and years and years. Now, I trade Bibles out all the time just because I like new stuff. I'll give one away or I'll put one on the shelf. But she's had the same Bible. And do you know how in a nice study Bible you have those blank pages in the back? You know, they just have those, those kind of leader pages in the back. In my wife's Bible, they're not blank. Those pages in the back of my wife's Bible are scribbled on and every piece of white space is taken and, and there are just notes everywhere. But they're not just crazy notes. This is the Kathy Addis Hall of Fame notes. These are the things when she heard a sermon or she read something or she got something off the radio or TV that was so, and not, not just write in a journal good, but so good, I'm willing to write it in the back of my Bible good. I mean, these are the things when she hears it, she's like, oh, I never want to forget that. And she'll write that in the back of her Bible. And so she'll come up to me at the end of a weekend sometime and go, that was a good sermon, babe. I'm like, really? She goes, oh, yeah. And then she'll make up something that <laughs> she thinks I want to hear because she's loving. And then I'll ask, did I get anything in the back of the book? No. Because it wasn't that good. But every now and then, she comes up to me and she goes, you made the cut. <laughs> Shazam. When I get put in the back of the book, I know that was the bomb diggity. That's a camp sermon. I'm going to keep that one right there. I say, what was it? What was so good? Oh, yeah, that was good. Woo that was good stuff right there. And no matter what anybody else says, I know that when it gets put in the back of the book that that was something worth keeping. Certainty. Say that with me. Certainty. Now you need to understand that Noah was born in an age in which the, the discipline of God was not a maybe. It was a 
Do you want to know why Jesus Christ was sent? Because when the time had fully come, God sent his son. It was certain. There was no escape for us. We had to have a savior. Third, are we learning anything new about Noah? We doing okay? Verse 14, it says, but make yourself an ark of gopher wood. And then dot, 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 because then it goes into how many cubits by this many cubits by that many cubits. It's interesting, but you can read that on your own if you want. Verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark. Now, this is probably my favorite part of what we have in the Noah story, because we know about Noah's character. He was a righteous man, and his name meant rest, that we know that Noah came when the world was corrupt and God's judgment was going to fall. But here's what's really interesting. The story of Noah is the fact that God offered a plan for rescue. When we were lost, God offered a plan for rescue. Everybody say rescue. rescue. We, he offered, he says, build an ark. Build, now, what's an ark? Well, an ark is interesting because an, an, ark is, an ark is what it is. An ark is just like uh, we heard in, in the Old Testament. We're going to talk a little bit about this in a moment. Uh, but, but an ark was a box. It doesn't mean boat. When you think ark, you think boat, don't you? But, but that's not what it was. An ark was a box. It was the same word used for coffin. So it just means this box. So, so what do we mean when we say that God offered us a rescue plan? He said, build an ark. Well, it was a rescue, but this rescue is amazing because the ark was not what saved us. The ark is what gave us what saved us. Let me try this one more time. The ark is not what saved us. The ark is what gave us what saved us. Now, what am I talking about? In the second half of this passage here in verse 18, I will establish my covenant with you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Noah. And he's talking to every descendant of Noah. Now get this, you say, how does Noah look like Jesus? Because God said, when the rest of humanity is wiped out, I'm asking you to build an ark so that when you go into the ark, I can save you and make a new covenant with you. And God said, I will save the whole world through one man. Where else did he do that? Through Jesus Christ. And he said, I'll make a new covenant. Everybody say covenant. I'll make it nice and loud. Everybody say covenant. I'll make a covenant through you. And what did Jesus say at the Last Supper? He, he takes the bread and says, this is my body broken for you. He says, take this cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. It's a, it's a contract. In other words, through Noah, we get a picture of Jesus that God said, there is a contract that is on you, but I'm going to make a new contract, and I'm going to save everybody through you. Just like he looked at his son Jesus and said, through you, I will bring salvation to everyone. Through one man, salvation will come. And we get a picture of it as God saved the entire human species through one man named Noah. I had an online discussion this last week, actually today, a Facebook discussion. There's some things that some people don't get fired up enough about. This is one of the things that I really get fired up about. Oh, by the way, I never filled in the blank, did I? A new covenant. I got so excited, I got ahead of it. Let me tell you about this online discussion. I was actually sitting at a coffee shop, and I heard this phrase. No, we don't have small. We have regular, and we have large. Okay, let me say that again, because this should offend you more, being smart people. Let me try this one more time. No, we don't have small, we have regular, and we have large. Really, nothing? No, no one's going to be, I, I'm outraged by that, because help me out. How smart do you have to be to understand that by process of elimination, <laughs> if one is large, and the regular is not as large, that makes it? Small. Thank you. <laughs> Great Google, how, how hard is this? I sat there for an hour and a half and I heard it again, but they use different language. No, 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 we don't have medium. We have regular and we have large. Now I can almost buy that because you gotta you got have three to have a medium. <laughs> can I get an amen in the house? It's just, but think about it. If you, I don't, we don't serve a small. Yes, you do. I don't care what you call it. If this one is smaller than that one, that's the small. Can I get an amen in the house? I don't, I don't know why that bothers me so much. It's just, by the way, I believe in submitting to your authorities. I believe that Romans 13 tells us that we are to obey at every cost, but I am willing to pick up arms and fight against any government or authority that is willing to move us to the metric system. Can I get an amen on that? I'm American. It is inches and miles. Can I get a hallelujah out there? 
thank you so much. Because it is stupid to say, give them a centimeter and they'll take a kilometer. That just sounds dumb, doesn't it? <laughs> you may think I'm off track, but I'm dead on track right now. I'm telling you why. It's about standards. It's about measurements. And religion, up until this point, religion had been about tying up those heavy burdens and putting them on backs and having to make sacrifice because you can never make God happy and having to live by the book and having people who look down on you and ostracize you because you couldn't qualify. And God says, no more. Through this one man, I'm going to show grace to all of humanity. I should have wiped you all out, but through Noah, I will let you all survive. And he is an echo of the one named Jesus Christ. And no longer, everybody say, no longer. No longer do you have to do these religious things. No longer do you have to practice this incredible standard. No longer do you have to measure up. I'm going to send my son. He'll measure up for you. He'll set the standard for you. And by his grace, by his authority, and by his name, you'll have access on his behalf. You don't have to be good to go to heaven. You have to trust Jesus. You have to understand that through one man, everybody say one man. And we have a picture in Noah, but we have the reality in Jesus. Through one man, our sinfulness and our brokenness, he takes that heavy burden off of us and gives us rest. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? One more. Whew, I'm sweating. I need to spend more time at the gym, don't I? Thank you for not answering that. What did the ark provide for us? Now, I also already mentioned that the ark was just a box, right? And when we think of ark, we think of a boat. Can I give you the honest reality? People call the ark a boat, but most people who look at that who are engineers, they say it would float, but it's actually just a really long house that's very well built. If you'll read the instructions, it actually says the center of the boat is supposed to be one cubit higher than the edges of the boat, which would give a slope to the roof to let all the water drain off. It says that there was a window. I don't know if that was a skylight or if they figured out something we didn't know they had at that time. But I mean, it, it was like a house, but, but the house was built to withstand the flood. What you got to understand is it's not a boat because a boat would need to be steered and have sails. It didn't need any of that. You see, what they needed was just something to save them from the coming flood. And what they needed was that ark. The ark was a house that would be protective of them when the floodwaters came. Now, I had you repeat a phrase, or I, I, I emphasized it earlier. Look what it says in verse 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. Everybody say, it bore up. It bore up. It bore up. Now, this is an interesting phrase. It bore up. In other words, this boat, it didn't, it didn't sail. It didn't go anyplace. All it did was rescue them, and it reminds us that the ark provides salvation. This word ark is the same word that was used for Moses when he was placed in a basket. He was actually placed in an, in an ark. And, and, and remember, raiders of the lost ark. It's the same word right there, the elements of, uh, of the old tabernacle that were put in there in the mercy seat of God. If you know any of the terminology, it's just a box. But it doesn't matter. It's not really about the box. It's about what goes in the box. Everybody say, in the box. You see, Noah was saved because he went into the ark. And we were saved because, what does it say? We were in Jesus Christ. There are 82 phrases in the New Testament that end with this, in Christ or in Jesus Christ. And we are saved because we are in Christ. And when we are in Christ and the wrath of God comes raging down on us, when the floodwaters of destruction hit us, not because we are good, not because we got to figure it out, but when we are in Christ, we are born up on the waters and raised high above it all. Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? But do you know what's best? If I give this to you, you've got to stay with me. This is, my, this is one of my favorite parts. I know every part's my favorite part. It just changes as I get to it. Here we go. This also teaches us that the ark gives us a second chance. Who in here needs a second chance? If you're not raising your hand, you don't know it, but you need a second chance. We all need it. Everybody say everybody. everybody. We all need a second chance. When we moved here 12 years ago, Kathy and I moved here with uh, a big, ugly, seafoam, green Chevy Vandura van. It was hideous. And we'd had it for several years because I was a pastor and a youth pastor, and we were carting kids everywhere, and we had a couple kids of our own, and, 
And it was one of those old bad vans, you know, big old Chevy van, almost a church van, but not quite long enough. Had the shag carpet in it, you know what I'm talking about, that could never be cleaned. You'd, you'd walk on it, but you wouldn't want to lay on it. It was just bad. It, and, it was, it, and it was hot, and it was always breaking down. We all, it was always needing something done to it. And it was usually air conditioning. It was, it was something that was wrong with this thing. So when we moved here, we decided we're not going to set ourselves in that position where we're going to be transportation for everybody. So let's get rid of the van. And we were never so happy to take that van to a dealership and just say, what do you give us for it? And they looked at it and said, well, what do you give us for it? We don't even want that thing, you know? I mean, it was bad. But they, they gave us a little bit of money for it, and I actually felt like we robbed them. You know, because it's, cause they look, I'm honest, I'm, I'm a priest. They said it wasn't in good shape, and I went... <laughs> No, I'm just lucky it drove here. That's, I mean, it, it's not good. And, and so Kathy and I, we, we asked them, so what are you going to do with it? And they said, well, we'll probably scrap it, but we may take it to an auction and see if anybody wants to do anything with it, but it's probably just going to go to scrap. And we didn't feel bad about it at all, man. We drove off with a decent car. It was really good, feeling good about life. And, and so that's just been a part of our family, our history, our memory. About a year ago, we started seeing it around town. You say, no, no, it just had to look like it. No, 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 I got up close. I looked, it has the old sticker from the dealership we bought it at in Texas. It has the broken step that maybe I broke one day on vacation. I looked inside, it's our van. I saw, I, the first time I saw it, I was like, <gasps> a wave of fear. My thought was, I did that to somebody. I remember going home and telling Kathy, you're never going to believe what I saw today. What? I saw the old green van. She goes, oh, you saw a van like that? And I go, no, I saw our van. She goes, shut up. You did not. <laughs> a couple weeks later, she comes back. She goes, I saw it too. <laughs> I saw it too. Not only have we been seeing it around town, in the last couple months, it started parking down the street. <laughs> we see it every day. And we look, every time we see it, there's silence in the car like, shh, there it goes. <laughs> Just a couple weeks ago, we were at the strip mall down the street over here, and Kathy and I came walking out, and I went, oh, there it is. <laughs> and it was just pulling up, and the dude driving it just sat in it. And I said, we got to do it. And she goes, what are you doing? I go, come with me. And I went over to him. I said, hey. And he's kind of like, what, 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 what? It's just weird having a guy walk up to you in a parking lot. I said, hey, I just wanted you to know. This is our old van. And I thought, man, those are probably fighting words. He's going to come out and smack me is what he's going to do. After, you serious? But he didn't. He goes, oh, I love this van. I'm like, what? I looked at him face to face. I, I'm not, I said, seriously? My wife went, no. He goes, no, I love this van. He says, I'm going to drive this van till the wheels fall off. I, I want this van. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, no, no, no. I did this to it, and I fixed this. And he goes, oh, it's so comfortable. He goes, I'm going to drive this van forever. I'm like, are you being serious? He goes, no, look around the front. And he made me go around the front of the van. I looked. He had taken the Chevy emblem off and put an incredible Hulk emblem on there. <laughs> he called it the Hulk. I'm over there going, so you love this thing? He goes, I love this thing. It's a piece of junk. <laughs> it's a piece of trash. They, they, they. But he loves it. And because he loves it, he takes care of it. And because he loves it and he takes care of it, it'll run forever. He's given it a second chance. In your life, somebody may have told you you're broke you are nasty, you are busted. You may have looked in the mirror and said, you got nothing left, you have failed, you just need to be traded in, you need to be salvaged. And no matter what anybody else has said to you, the God of the heavens is going, no, 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 I love it. It's amazing. Oh, I'll work on it, I'll take care of it, I'll cherish it. I'm gonna give it brand new life. The Ark of the Covenant. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. For he has wiped you clean. He has repaired your chassis. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I will not say it again one time. He has given you. How beautiful is this? He has given you and me 
and all of us, just like he gave humanity a second chance through the man called Noah, in Christ Jesus, Amen. he's given us a second chance. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And I pray that the words that were spoken here would be a blessing to you so that you might use them by your Holy Spirit to change us. Please, Father, give us the grace necessary to move forward, knowing that we are not so broken you wouldn't save us, knowing that we are not so far gone that you would not bring us into the ark, that when we are in your Son, Christ Jesus, we are saved through the one man. Thank you for the story of Noah showing us a picture of Jesus who helped lift us high above the, the torrential waters and save us from our own destruction. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said.